Hello and welcome to the University of Nottingham. With me today is Dr. Peter Watts. Many people will know the New Testament, and will know its books, but not so well known is the fact that within those books are hymns. And he's going to try and introduce to us the topic of the hymns that are in the New Testament. Peter, number one, you're welcome. And number two, will you, start, will you tell us something about the hymns that are embedded in the New Testament? Yeah, I think the hymns in the New Testament are a wonderful topic for study because it's almost like unlocking a hidden secret, if you like, that, that really gives us a wealth of information about the New Testament. Because it's very easy to read the New Testament without realising that there are hymns within it. When we think of a hymn, we very often think of what we hear in a church setting nowadays. So something with verses, stanza, going rhythmically, rhyming. And those are the hymns that are developed uh, in one period, you know, owing their existence to people like Charles Wesley and Isaac Watts. And in fact, the development of those itself is, is a Christian development with the fourth century with, with Ambrose. So talking about rhyme, talking about meter, talking about verses. Therefore, when we talk about hymns in the New Testament, we have to sort of redefine that term, if you like. We have to say, what are we actually looking for? And when we talk about hymns in the New Testament, very often we're talking about something that stands out from its surrounding prose context. And um, one of the ways that we might identify him in the New Testament is perhaps a change of language where all of a sudden we've got a lot of relative pronouns. That means the idea of he who does this. Uh, perhaps a change in person. So we've had uh, standard prose in a Pauline epistle. He's addressing his readers. And then suddenly he talks about Christ. And so okay, he who does this and does this. And even then we have a change in sort of uh, metre in terms of short, concise, well-constructed sentences. And these are what we call hymns. But the difficulty is how were they sung? What did they sound like? When we hear the word hymn, we're thinking of music. Mm. But in the New Testament, this actually is a change of, of style initially. So, so the wealth of information that comes from discovering this change of style is, what then do we do with this? What can it tell us? So to give you one very famous example, in Philippians 2, we have the so-called Philippian hymn. So Paul's addressing the Philippians, giving them sort of almost uh, mundane instructions, if you like. And then all of a sudden he talks about Christ and goes off into the Philippians hymn, Philippians 2, 6 to 11, where we do get this, this relative pronoun, Christ, who did this? Taking the form of a servant, humbled himself. This kind of language. So what does this tell us? Why does Paul do this? Well, on the one hand, it could just be that the early church was infused with the kind of uh, the Holy Spirit, if you like, or the idea of, of the, the charisma, the idea that they were so enthusiastic about the risen Christ and what they perceived to be the good news of salvation and so on, that they couldn't help but break into him. And so Paul just does this. In his letter writing, he suddenly takes this exalted form of writing to praise Christ. So, it's, so on the one hand, this argument that it could be a Pauline composition. But from the beginning of the 20th century, really, um, with the advent of form criticism, which started um, very much in the, the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, with, with figures like Gunkel, and then developed in the New Testament, scholars started to say, but, but actually this change in style, this is such a strange thing. Does this point to something else? And what they suggested is that Paul is actually using an earlier form, a form that was used in worship, for example a hymnic form. And that's where we get the idea of these, these different types of texts within, embedded within prose context being hymns. So from this point then the question is, well, what do we know about that earlier context, that earlier context of worship? And we're doing a two-way study here. On the one hand, what does the Philippian hymn, for example, tell us about that context of worship? But also, what does that earlier context of worship the Philippian church, for example, how does that illuminate the Philippian hymn? Is it really a hymn as opposed to a Pauline composition? Mm. So a fascinating topic of study. And of course, in the New Testament itself, I'm thinking the, you know, sing songs, psalm songs and sacred hymns, uh, a, a reference that Paul makes. Mm. And of course, at the end of the Last Supper discourse in John, mm. you know, when they sang a hymn, then they went out and crossed the Kedron Valley. Yeah. So we do actually have references to these mm -hmm. hymns. Mm -hmm. And knowing that there are hymns in, 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 in the letters of Paul allows us to get a sense that these references are actually the way these churches are actually thinking about themselves and imagining what the community around Jesus was like. Mm -hmm. 
But could I take you in a different direction and, and say, the very fact that we know that there are all these hymns, you've mentioned the Philippians hymn, but there's the one in Ephesians, Colossians, and there's the one in Colossians, and then there's bits of hymns probably in the, in the, le in the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. They're also reminding us of the essentially oral environment in which the New Testament mm. came into being. Mm -hmm. This, again, is a very important aspect of studying the hymns in the New Testament because what it can do is shed light on that oral development of, of doctrine, essentially. Um, a number of these hymns you've mentioned, the Colossian hymn, the Philippian hymn, a fragment in Ephesians, for example, these are Christological hymns. They're hymns about Christ. And what they perhaps do is reflect the early development of Christology, so talking about Christ. And so in that oral culture, well, something's happened. The Christ event has happened. Jews for example, are trying to make sense of it. How do they do that? Well, they do it in the context of worship, sometimes with the words of the Psalms, which are themselves understood messianically, then applied to Jesus, and then developing the understanding of Christ, so Christology, in that context of worship. So, so that's why these hymns are incredibly important for telling us about the development of Christology. And in fact, this is itself a point of controversy because there are a number of scholars, and it's a growing number in the, the last decade or so, who have refuted the idea that some of these passages, such as Philippians 2 and so on, are genuinely hymns. Rather, they would argue that the change in style and so on is a, a form of rhetoric, epideictic rhetoric. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons, the underlying reasons for a number of these arguments is because of an uneasiness about an early high Christology. Because if we say the Philippian hymn actually arose in the context of worship before Paul wrote his letter to the Philippians, then we're saying very early on, within 20 years of Jesus' death, people had come to praise him beside God, to sing hymns mm -hmm. about him and to him. And very interestingly, we've got external attestation for this. So on the one hand, you mentioned that within the New Testament, we do have explicit reference to hymns. At the end of uh, the Matthew and Last Supper, we have um, Jesus and the got the man's words, and they sing a hymn, which, which is this, probably the Hallel, so a, a Jewish psalm of praise. And in this context, we have explicit references. The same for the famous hymns in Luke's Gospel, fantastic hymns in, in Luke 1 and 2, the Magnificat, the Nunc Dimittis, the Benedictus, the Gloria, all Latin names because they're used in Christian liturgy mm. um, famously. So they've, they've been taken from their New Testament context where, where they're referred to explicitly. Though it doesn't say sang, Mary sang, it says Mary said, but this verb lego in Greek is a lot more flexible than our English verb said, so it could infer mm. singing. But the point is we also have external attestation. There's, a, there's a, a paucity perhaps of explicit references within the New Testament. Some of them are hard anyway, revelation, very hard to determine whether these relate to earthly worship because it's a heavenly context. But externally we have Pliny's letter to Trajan, which is a, a very solid and important source of evidence to early Christian hymn singing. So this is a letter that Pliny wrote to Trajan at the beginning of the second century from Bithynia, which is in modern day Turkey. And one of the things he mentions is that the Christians there, and it's problematic to him, had this habit of meeting regularly before dawn and singing a hymn to Christ as if to a god. And so actually this is external attestation of the idea that something like their Philippian hymn, praising Christ alongside God, was, was something that the, the Christians would have done in their early worship. But of course, one of the things about using Pliny there, Pliny is writing in 113, 112, mm. 113, and of course, that allows plenty of time for a high Christology to emerge. And those who are opposing a high Christology emerging quickly are arguing for the 50s and 60s mm -hmm. and the 20-year the gap. But actually, there is a, uh, uh, there, is an, uh, there is a counter argument to the high Christology, and that is that the high Christology is itself a product of, of course, cultic worship mm. and hymn singing, that it's actually within the, the, the ritual memory of these churches that the high Christology is actually being driven. Mm -hmm. And of course, the other argument that this has developed um, in a Gnostic context even before the first century, this kind of praise. But I think the, uh, 
perhaps the argument towards the high Christology is the consistency with, it, with which the New Testament is sort of peppered with these Christological hymns, all addressed towards Christ and from a range of contexts with Asia Minor also. The other interesting thing about hymns at that time, of course, is the evidence from Philo. Because, of course, when he's talking about the Therapeutae and the Therapeutae three days down in Egypt, mm. uh, they, at their great community gatherings, which are very similar to early Christian meals in Hosea, they are, of course, the, the leader has to sing an elaborate hymn. Mm, mm. And so it's interesting that here's another piece of external attestation whereby a community's whole praise of God is expected to take this hymn form. Mm, absolutely. And what's very interesting there is that in that particular example with the therapeutic, uh, it talks about uh, responsorial singing, singing alternately. Right, so yes. Even the, the form of the singing actually matches Pliny's example, for example, where uh, he talks about the early Christians singing responsorially one to another. And so uh, perhaps even the idea that the form of the singing itself shares some common history. And that might be actually um, in Exodus 15, where we've got the Song of the Sea. And Moses sings... Uh, and sings this great song of victory, mm. and then Miriam responds. And it might be that that was taken as the model for this kind and, of And of course, the truth enunciated by Augustine is true both of the earlier period of which you're studying and indeed of liturgy today. He who sings prays twice. Absolutely. Peter, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>